My name is Bon Thorn. I am from Cambodia. I was born and raised on a boat in a floating village. My family was very poor because both of my parents, they uneducated. Growing up during the genocide, you're in Cambodia during 1975 to 1979. The horror began almost immediately. Phnom Penh, a city of two and a half million people, was forcibly emptied within hours of their coming. The sick and wounded being dragged from their hospital beds, dying children being carried in plastic bags. The genocide will focus on killing all the educated people. So my parents who growing up during that time, they didn't get to go to school and get education. And because of that, our family was living very poor. My father, he's a fisherman, and he also an alcoholic. There were times like whenever my dad drunk, we would jump off the boat and swim to our neighbor's house to hide over there until my dad fall asleep and then we'll swim back home. Because we knew that something gonna happen at the end of the day, he gonna beat us up. One day when I was seven years old, I got sick. I cannot eat anything. My mom started to worry about me, and she wanted to bring me to the hospital. But my dad told my mom, to just let me die. If I'm lucky enough, I will survive. If not, they can make more babies. I'm laying there, hurting what my dad said. I feel like I'm useless, like my dad didn't love me. Then there's something to tell me that when I grow up, I want to become a nurse so I can help the children that in the same situation like me. So the next few days, I feel better. And I went to my dad and told him that I want to go to school. But my dad, he didn't believe in education. At that time, I was 10 or 11 years old. One day, I went fishing with my uncle on the boat, just me and him, and I was raped by him. So when I come back home, I told my parents about what happened. And when my mom went and told the police about what happened, my dad went and told my uncle to escape. So my uncle already left before the police get there. One day the village leader be able to find me and he told me that I need to move to live in a safe house because since now they haven't arrested my uncle yet. So for my safety, I had to move to live over there. After that, I moved to live in that center, which is with a lot of girls that been trafficked and went through the situation like me. The counselor will come to me and talk to me about what I've been through. And then one day, she told me about Jesus. She told me about how he died on the cross to love and forgive those people, even those that sins against him. And I cannot understand any of that because my dad and my uncle, who I can see and talk to, cannot even love me, then how can? God that I never know, I never met before, love me. And it's really hard for me to forgive them. While I'm, I am living in that center, I also get to go to church every Sunday. And one time, they have a three-day Bible study. Then at the end of the day of the class, the teacher brought in the red and the green box. And the teacher told us that that was the special gift for us. And when we heard the word gift, we were so excited because growing up, we never celebrate birthday or Christmas. So that was my first gift. And at that time, I was 13 or 14 years old. So all my friend and I, we saw the gift and we tried our best to behave. For me and my friend, it was my first gift. And to wait all my friend to get the box, and to count one, two, three, it seems so long. So we just go ahead and open the box. Wow. 
When I opened my shoebox, the first thing I saw was a new pair of flip-flops. And those mean a lot to me because living in that center, I only get to buy shoes once a year, so that's an extra pair for me, so it's so special. Then there's another item that I love so much in that box, was the stuffed animal. So I used to grow up and eat animal. I never knew that they can make an animal so soft that we can snuggle with. Like growing up, I had no toys, no TVs. I saw the stuffed animal. While I looked through the item in my shoebox, this question came into my mind. I asked myself that, who did this? Like, who sent me this gift? Because they don't know who I am. Then I start to remember the teacher mentioned that this is from the people that love God and they want to bless us with this gift. The shoebox showing me that even though my dad didn't love me, he didn't want me, but there's a father in heaven that loves me so much and he, he loved me so much that he can make someone that don't even know who I am to send me the box to show me that I am loved and I am valuable. Even though my early father didn't love me, but there's a heavenly father that loves me. Now I'm going to college, pursuing my childhood dream to become a nurse. The box is not just about new items in the box, but it's about the real joys and the real love that will last with me and with those children forever. It's the box that helps them to find the true love and the true hope for their life. I want to say this to you. <clears throat> and I hesitate because I'm speaking to a group of people. But I want to speak as if I'm speaking to only one. I'm speaking to every individual. One to one. You are loved. If I could convince you, I'd do it myself. And I do love you. When I first heard a pastor say that, I scoffed. I thought, talk is cheap. You don't know me. And if you did, you wouldn't love me. You ever thought that? It's not based on anything other than the initiation of love. And I will tell you that love transforms. It'll change your life. Now there's the boy-girl love, the man-wife love. There's the love of parents to children. But there's the kind of love that's even deeper than that, the love from God that's expressed by people of God to people everywhere, regardless of whether or not they are people of God. Can you look at somebody on the street and feel God's love for them? Can you look at the people that are rioting and have absolutely lost their mind and are doing un-American things and you want to be a five-fold ministry? Can you look at them with the love of God? Because don't you know that if they knew Jesus the way you do, they wouldn't be consumed with rage and anger and murder and violence and contempt and all, all those things that are consuming their lives? The answer isn't a new president. The answer is Jesus and people loving them. So many of those folks grew up without 
love in the home without a father in the home or a father who demonstrated he didn't love them. And um, I just want you to know that you're loved. You're loved by me. You're loved by Pam. Somebody gave um, a wonderful compliment to the church last week on the phone. I was talking to them and they said, you have such a wonderful body of people there. They are so loving and so kind and so accepting of new people who come. And uh, I agree with that. You are, in fact, quite awesome. And I want to compliment you for that. But I want you to know that I see it and I love you for that. But I love you in spite of maybe not knowing you well. Pam and I decided when we moved here that whoever God brought, we would love them. We had no idea who it would be. There have been a couple of folks that have made us want to change our minds. <laughs> I heard a guy say, um, God has never let me down. A couple of times he scared me real bad, but he never let me down. <laughs> I've been a couple of times I've wondered if I made the right decision, but not really. Um, I know Roy would agree with me that when, when you are ministering the, the Word of God to people that are receiving the Word of God, it is the most gratifying, fulfilling thing that you know you're fulfilling the call of God on your life. And I'm asking every one of you to ask the Lord, what is your call on my life and to whom... Am I supposed to be the picture of Jesus to somebody? Who, who is that person? Is it in my family? Is it outside my family? Is it people I haven't met yet? Make up your mind ahead of time that when God brings you someone, you will love them. God will bring you the hurting, the despairing, the distraught. He'll bring you the unlovable. He'll bring you the incorrigible. And we are to love them. It doesn't mean you don't tell the truth. Does it mean you don't help hold people accountable? Listen, God's word is still God's word, whether you like it or agree with it or not. You, you with me on that? The Bible is still the absolute, unadulterated, pure word of God to instruct or correct or even rebuke us. But underneath all that, as you know, God loves you. So it's, it's not like a club, that kind of a club. This kind of a club I like. That kind of a club, not so much. I want to talk about freedom versus tyranny. Because when you don't have freedom, that's what you do have is tyranny. It's one or the other. And we'll talk about this in spiritual terms. And you can certainly make the application then over to a national or political terms. But the tyranny of government is absolute and capricious and um, authoritarian, controlling, usually by some government ruler or government or ruler. There's some examples through history. The Idi Amin, you guys know that name? If you're under 40, you might not. Adolf Hitler, otherwise known as Donald Trump. I was looking at something online last night, a, a friend of mine. And I thought, well, you're not saved. <laughs> it's, it's just funny. People get all worked up. Listen, presidents come and go. They're just people like you and me. They're flawed. Read Romans 13. If you're upset about the political climate today, just wait. It'll change. But you need to read Romans 13 and get that settled as a bedrock of your understanding of life. In a nutshell, there is no authority that God has not put it in place. No, no authority anywhere. God didn't put it in place. Don't that take you off? Lenin, Stalin, Chairman Mao, Paul Pot of Cambodia back in the 70s. He was involved in a real genocide in Cambodia. Um, there's the tyranny of sin. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered, <laughs> We're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you'll be made free? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin, 
is a slave of sin. You should just let that sit there for a minute. Nobody commits sin accidentally. You decide. You make a decision. And when you do, you become a slave to that thing. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. So whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. You don't play with sin. Sin is a cruel taskmaster, and it pays a wage called death. Who comes to kill, steal, and destroy? The devil does. So when you're involved in sin, you're doing hell's bidding. And everything you touch will be killed or destroyed or stolen. Either you will steal it from somebody or it will be stolen from you. The stealing, the killing, and the destroying are the works of sin. So if you think you can live in rebellion against God and still be free, you are mistaken. That is not possible. There is a tyranny of sin, and it demands obedience. Only the strong in the Lord can resist sin. Your flesh is not capable of resisting sin. The appeal is too great to the flesh. It is too much, it's too often, it's too cunning, he's too sly. As I said last week, you are not above being tricked. You think you stand, take heed lest you fall. Sin demands allegiance, demands obedience, and it is a tyrant. Have any of you ever been sinners? (laughs) Am I preaching to the choir here? Because choir members don't sin, obviously. The trick of sin is that it comes disguised as what you want. It doesn't come up and say, hey, I got some destruction and death for you. No, it comes disguised as what you want. Oh, I want that. But it it really is a prison with no escape. And only surrender to Christ can free you from its grip. Romans 6.12 reading from the New Living Translation, second edition, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. I'm always amazed. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. I know you can't believe I'm amazed because I'm just so amazing myself. No, I men's there. Okay, maybe next lie you'll get it. Okay. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master. Oh, we're going to have to take that language out, aren't we? That was political. That was free. You didn't get that? The word master? All master locks are going to have to be renamed? Oh, never mind. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Well, then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death. Or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Do you you see that the backdrop there is your attitude, what your decision making is? So nobody is a victim. So thank God once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching which we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin and you have become slaves to righteous living. Because of the weakness of your human nature, I'm using this illustration of slavery to help you understand all this. Previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity And lawlessness, see what we're experiencing in our culture is nothing new, which led 
even deeper into sin, now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do, things that end in eternal doom. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. And here's the famous verse. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And I wanted to throw in an additional scripture or two. 1 Corinthians 6. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes, or practice homosexuality, or are thieves, or greedy people, or drunkards, or are abusive, or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. That's true, though someday God will do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord. And the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise us from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scriptures say the two are united into one. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Run from sexual sin. Picture of uh, Genesis 39, is it, where Joseph ran from Potiphar's wife? Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. I bet nobody thinks like that except Bible people. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? Don't, you do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. So, a couple of slides and we're done. Satan is the tyrant. Sin is the government of his tyranny. Its characteristics, sin's characteristics are rebellion, pride, anger, lawlessness, perversion, and various sins of the flesh. But this is the point I referenced earlier that I said I would get to later. We're there. These sinful things, uh, disguised as what you want, are cloaked in language that eases our guilt. Words like dysfunction, addiction, she has issues. They have issues. Those words take the sting and the stigma away from the sins that are so awful. Since sin is a rebellion against God and often against nature, we don't want to say that. We don't want people to feel guilty. Let me just talk for a second about guilt. Guilt is a spiritual condition when a person is um, deciding to live contrary to what they know is God's preference for them. They have internally at least said, I'm not doing that. Those rules do not apply to me. I don't have to live by those standards. 
the result of that is behavioral and relational issues. Those sins of rebellion and defiance are not cute. They're not personality quirks. They're not excusable. It's just way deeper than the word dysfunction or addiction. It is defiance. It is rebellion. It is sin. And God says, if you make those choices, there will be consequences. Now, consequences at the, at the very beginning are relational. Those are supposed to be signs that something is amiss. So when there are relational issues, it should be a cue. Something's not right. But we're such master deflectors. We don't really want to admit that we're that wrong, so we don't, we don't own our own sin. We say we haven't yet found the right one. We haven't found the person that's compatible. Yada, yada. When in fact, God might send you somebody that he knows will rub you just the wrong way so that you will be forced to consider that you're not what you think you are. Just say it. Is it possible, consider this, is it possible that God loves you enough that he would put people in your life that would cause a logjam, wouldn't go with the flow, would get a little sideways, clog up everything, just so you will see, I'm not as wonderful and spiritual and pure and loving and kind and Christ-like as I would like people to think I am. Is it possible that Jesus would love you enough to mess with you, you decide. It's the last slide. I would like for you to make today a day of freedom. This coming Saturday is July 4th when we celebrate a national freedom. But we, people of God, should always be considering how free are we. Not as a nation. I mean, that's worthy of consideration as well. If something isn't done soon, we're going to lose the country that we love. Now, even though I know God is sovereign and God knows what's coming, I don't really know. I read a Bible that says things are going to get worse, not better. And uh, I know that someday soon I will die, but I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. I want to be out of here. But until I am... I need to be salt and light. I need to somehow try to make a difference, speak truth to people, love on people, and hold people accountable. Pray for those who have decision-making authority. All of those in power need the wisdom of God. But as you know, there's wickedness in high places. So we who are the church, our reflex ought to be pray. Perhaps fast and pray rather than just pray fast. We should probably pray quickly, but we should pray continually. So let's make today a day of freedom. Make a decision that you're not going to be bound by the sins of the flesh or the sins of pol politics or parties or, I mean, let the Word of God, <laughs> it's an iPad, but the Bible's in here. Let the Word of God be true and every man a liar. Whatever party you think is your party, if it violates the Word of God, you need to lose that party and stick to the Scriptures. I couldn't care less. God doesn't come riding on a donkey or an elephant. He didn't come to do anything other than take over. He's the king, and we should surrender, and we should let God be in charge. He didn't come to take sides. One party isn't better than another, although one party is better than another. <laughs> but the Word of God is where I'm sticking with. And any party, party that violates the Word of God, sorry, I'm out. Can't go there with you. I don't care what other, other good you do. You're violating God's Word, we're done. I'm sticking with the Scriptures. And if that means I have no affiliation, then so be it. 
Let God be true. Let God be God. So, one more click. Your freedom has already been purchased at Calvary. One more click and we're done. The rest is up to you, right? So, God's done His part. So, invite His Holy Spirit to live in you in power. Not just in theory. Not just in, in some... Um, actual sense but nothing that makes a difference I mean do you understand that if the power of God resides in you you have victory over everything that comes against you that's your right as a child of God does that mean you'll never experience defeat no it doesn't mean that sometimes God will allow defeat to make you stronger teach you lessons of perseverance and all those things that you need to develop as character. God knows exactly what you need to be developed. And God is in the business of developing you and me so we will rule and reign with him. So, Lord, we invite you to come. Remind us of where we need to repent. Strengthen those, Lord, who make decisions and may our country thrive instead of uh, go under. But Lord, whatever the case will be, let the church be the church. Let the people of God be the people of God. Let us be salt and be light. And uh, Lord, thank you for raising up Julie with a vision in our congregation to keep us inspired that we'll give boxes that change nations. But Lord, in the meantime, we've got neighbors and people we work with and relatives and family and all of that. Lord, we want to be what you call us to be. So may freedom ring. Amen. Love you guys. Thank you for being so attentive. I appreciate it very much.